don't believe in fairy tales I guess I've outgrown them But that doesn't mean that I don't believe There's something bigger than me Cause I've seen it in a hospital room When the doctor said sorry There's nothing more we can do well, it wasn't true. I've never seen a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. But I've got a promise I can hold in the middle of the struggle. God, if you said it, you'll perform it. May not be how I want you to. But here's what I will do. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. I trust in your promise. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. I've tasted your goodness.
they that wait on the Lord shall renew new their strength they shall mount up upon wings like an eagle and they soar they shall walk not get weary they shall run and not faint that's what happens when you wait that's what happens when you wait they that wait they that wait on the Lord shall renew new their strength they shall wound up up on wings like an eagle Today, you've got a very special opportunity because one of the guests that was at camp meeting this week was Bobby Lynch. Bobby Lynch is one of our missionaries. He's a very special guest who's with us this morning. And he's going to share with you about their ministry. I've been privileged. Jessica and I have been to Quito, Ecuador. We've worked with them. We've seen what's happening there. And I can tell you this. This is good soil, and you need to sow into Bobby and Tamitha Lynch hear your pastor today. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. If you're watching online, you can give online. Mark Missions, all you have to do is Mark Missions. 100% of that goes completely to Bobby and Tamitha because we want to bless them. We want them to continue to be able to do the work that God's called them to do, impact the lives that he's called them to. So I want you to let him know from Conneaut Church of God how much you appreciate him and welcome him this morning as he comes. Praise the Lord. What an amazing, wonderful opportunity it is to be here at Conneaut again. To be with family is what I feel like. I mean, will you be my family? Would you be my neighbor? I am excited to be here today. My wife, Tamitha, and I and our son James are in um, Quito, Ecuador. And uh, so we've been on lockdown for about 15 months. This is my first time to be in church in 15 months. And so I'm really excited. So if you see me run a jig or dance or do something, I, it's just because I am so excited to be in the presence of the Lord with his people, celebrating his good and goodness and his grace. Amen. So if you will continue to remember us in prayers, uh, Ecuador is still on basically lockdown. It is, I'll share a little bit more about some of the things that are going on, but unfortunately in Ecuador, they just do not have access to 
health care or facilities or medication like we do here in the States. And so about 15 months ago, they came, the government came in and just locked everything down and said, you're not moving, you're not working, you're just not going outside. And so basically for 15 months, we have been required by the government to wear masks as soon as we step out the front door in our vehicles driving, you have to wear a mask, or it's a month's wage uh, fine if you are caught without a mask on while driving your vehicle. That's $400 a month is minimum wage there in Ecuador. Yes, $400 a month is what I said is minimum wage. And so they will, um, they will uh, fine you that. And so the the expectation by the government is that one person from every family will leave the house one day a week but for about four hours to get your essentials, your goods, your, your medicine, or whatever else you need. So you talk about tight. That has been tight, and that has been tough for us. And especially, we'll talk more about our ministry, but within our community, who... Three out of five people live on less than $3 a day. This has just been horrific for them. They haven't been able to go work. They haven't been able to uh, purchase food or buy. They don't have any money for buying food and things like that. And so it's just been really tough. But I just want to give honor where honor is due. I hollered out, and I'm sorry, I'm from Alabama. I holler. I hollered out. I gave a holler, a shout out. To Pastor, uh, to Craig, and I said, and Pastor, and I said, man, we are hurting down here. Will you help us? Because our families are starving, literally starving. And so I called out, and Conneaut Church responded, Church of God responded as always. And to date, we have provided more than 30,000 emergency COVID relief meals in our community because of your grace and your generosity. And we can celebrate that today. So I thank you guys for coming alongside us and, and celebrating with us. And like I said, I'm so excited to be back in Conneaut. And anytime I get back to the States, I want to take just an opportunity to teach you a little bit of Spanish. So would you join with me today? I think I've shared this with you before, but I just get really excited. I want you to celebrate with us. I want to teach you a little bit of just one word of Spanish today. It, because around Latin America, throughout Latin America, when the pastor or the leader comes up on the stage to begin preaching, he shouts out in Spanish, he shouts out, who lives? And the, and the congregation responds, Christ. And so I want to teach you the word for Christ. Okay, so the word for Christ is Cristo. I didn't say Crisco. I said Cristo. So will you respond with me? Cristo. Cristo. All right, so I'm going to shout out Quien Bibe, that's who lives, Quien Bibe, and you will respond Cristo. And we're going to do this three times, and then we're going to shout like we really believe that he is alive in our hearts and in our communities and in our nation and in our world. So we're going to do this three times. So I'm going to go, Kim Bibe, you're going to shout Cristo. And we're going to do this three times. Are we ready? Kim Bibe. Kim Bibe. Kim Bibe. He is alive. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of praise today. He is alive, and we worship you today. Hallelujah. 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 The reason I get excited about that is because I want to highlight this local church has given so much generous offerings to Simisud. And so I want to, as a professor there at this seminary, I want to thank you. I want to thank the Conneaut Church of God for pouring into Simisud because I want to just highlight three of these church planters that Pastor Carson mentioned that we have been able over the past 15 months, we've been able to train and be a part of sending out. We're talking about Luisa here. Luisa, oh, I'm going to cry. Luisa here. She was, her parents forced her into prostitution when she was 16 years old. She was living that lifestyle of on the streets. And she heard a Pentecostal pastor 
preach a message of hope and life. And she found Jesus. And so she came to the Lord. And then somebody said, well, we're trying to tell other people about the Lord. And she's like, I got to tell people what God has done for me. Well, somebody trained me and helped me and sent me out. And so Louisa planted one of these churches. We're talking about Louise here. Louise was a pagan priest. He was a priest that was up in the mountains, a shaman who was doing the, the evil one's work. Let's just be honest about it. And so he was deceiving and he was, he was just, he was a vile person in this community. Louise here got terminal cancer. Louise was uh, going for chemotherapy. His nephew was a born again Christian. His nephew came to Luis's house and said, Luis, I'm going to pray for you. Luis laughed at him. Luis's nephew said, no, I'm going to pray for you that the Lord heals you. And Luis was like, oh, I don't believe in your God. You're crazy. You're wasting your time. He said his nephew prayed as he was leaving. Wouldn't even allow the nephew to pray for him. So the nephew was praying as he was leaving. Luis said that night he was woken up by a dream. He said the Lord spoke to him in that dream and said, I'm going to heal you and you're going to worship me for the rest of your life. And I'm going to show you my glory and you're going to honor me. He said he thought he was going crazy. So he went back to the doctor, went for his chemo, ther chemo treatment. He went for his chemo treatment, and the doctor said, we need to, we need to check, check out what's going on, see if this is working. And it was his second, only his second chemo treatment, okay? He went, and the doctors did the test, and they say, Luis, we don't know what happened, but you are completely healed. There is no cancer in your body at all. He said he fell to his knees in that doctor's office, and he said, the Lord God Almighty healed me, and I will serve him the rest of my days. And so Luis is one of those church planters that we have now been able to send out and to plant a church. I'm talking about Byron here. Byron, an alcoholic, uh, a wife beater. I'm just going to be honest about his story that he told me. He said, I was, I was the lowest of the low. I tried to commit suicide because I had no peace. I had no joy. I had no life. But a Pentecostal preacher sought me out and told me about the love of God. And I gave my life to Jesus, and he turned my life around, and he's restored my marriage. He's restored my family. And I can't do anything else except tell people about the love of God that brings life and transformation. So these are the church planters that we're talking about. And today they stood up on a stage in, a, in front of their congregations and they shouted, Key and Bebe, Cristo, Key and Bebe, Cristo, Key and Bebe, Cristo. He is alive. He's alive in their lives. He's alive in your life. He's alive in Conneaut. He's alive in Ohio. He is alive and we celebrate him today. Hallelujah. Can you tell that I've been bottled up for about 15 months? <laughs> Thank you for just letting me unwind and release in here. This is, this is amazing to be with you guys. And so out of that, I'm, you know, working with these church planters and teaching these Bible students, we, were, we felt called to plant a church and to start a ministry about seven years ago, as uh, Craig mentioned, Project M25. And so my wife, me, and a children's minister, she just was drawn to the kids and drawn to those children. And so I would like to share with you a video that kind of briefly introduces our church and our work and what we're doing in the community for those of you that may not be, uh, may not know about our ministry. So can we rewind that and start that video? In Matthew chapter 25, we have this familiar verse that tells us, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. It's this mandate that we find in Matthew chapter 25 that calls us all to care for those in need. 
And that's what Project N25 is all about. That is our practical way to care for those who are in need and hurting here in Quito, Ecuador. In this community, 80% of the families live in poverty. There are many simple health problems that these children have but go untreated because they cannot afford care or the government facilities that they go to are not adequately prepared to care for them. 31% of our children are suffering from some form of malnutrition. Two out of three children suffer from abuse. Due to the poor education system, many of our children are not able to read or they do not possess the skills needed to get a good job. A lot of these families don't have access to clean drinking water and so one of the things that we do here is we provide them with basic medication which means that they're protected against diseases that can come from drinking unclean water. We teach about the love of God and the hope that these children can have through Jesus Christ. We teach the children about the importance of basic healthcare practices such as brushing their teeth and then we provide them with materials like toothbrushes and toothpaste to use at home. We do our best to intervene and help when the children have medical necessities. We also provide the children with nutritional meals that are full of vitamins and protein to keep them healthy. And here at Agua Viva, we offer a safe place where kids can come, learn, grow and play. Yo agradezco bastante a Agua Viva porque mi hija está aquí y tiene muchos beneficios en aprendizaje, en tratar de ser una buena niña. Estoy más que todo feliz y tranquilo porque es la única institución que nos ayuda aquí a nosotros. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. So that gives you, yeah, we can give the Lord praise. That gives you a brief insight into uh, what we are doing there in Ecuador, where I am training. Uh, missionaries and church planters and pastors and other ministers and my wife, she gets to play with the kids and their families uh, all day and also I get to get that joy also also, also occasionally. And so on your chairs there, there's a brief little, um, you can see there's a little pamphlet there about our project as well as a little card there that kind of shares about our ministry and what we're doing there. But one of the things that we focused on, we, we realized in the community, was that our children, those kids, were always talking about stomach aches and stomach problems. And so they were, they were missing school, they were going to the doctors and things like that. And so uh, one of the things we realized, we could give them parasite medicine, but we kind of tracked it down that it was because they did not have access to safe drinking water. They didn't have clean drinking water. And it was uh, something that we took for granted. I grew up in the South, and so we would turn on the faucet and let it run for the whole time while we're brushing our teeth and then turn it off and wouldn't think anything about it. Craig, you've worked in the, the Pastor Dan, I think you've worked in that area. And so it's things that we took for granted how we have access to clean, safe drinking water here in the States. But here in Ecuador and throughout the majority of the world, they don't have access to clean water like this. And so we were, we were fighting an uphill battle with trying to treat them by doing parasite, giving them parasite medicine, and the kids were just always continually being sick. So we realized, well, we need to help them to have access to clean drinking water. And so several years ago, I presented this to Pastor Carson and to Craig, and this church came behind us and Pastor Carson, you and Jessica were with us in Brooke, I believe the first house that we went into to install this water filtration system. It's a simple gravity-fed filtration system. You can purchase this lifetime water filtration little, little filter here for about 150 bucks, two buckets, pour the dirty water in the top bucket, it filters through, and it gives clean water in the bottom bucket. And after about a month, when it kind of clogs up a little bit, you just backwash it with clean water, and it's good to go for another month. And so for about seven years, we've been 
installing these water filtration systems in the home. And now we have installed around 150 of these water filtration systems in the community. These are 150 families that have clean, safe drinking water for lifetime, for their life. And we give the Lord praise for that. A quick example of uh, the girl in the previous slide, her name is Maria. Maria here was, um, Maria here, when she was born, had a birth defect. And when she was a toddler, they had to put a pacemaker in her heart. And one of the things the doctor said was, hey, you got to take really good care of this kid because if she gets sick or any illness like these stomach issues, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wreak havoc on her health and her well-being. Well, daddy couldn't deal with this extra stress and pressure, so he just left Mama and, and Maria when she was just a little baby, and so he's gone out of the picture. So Maria's mom, get this, Maria's mom is at the bus. She works on the buses because uh, she collects money as people get on and off the buses. So Maria's mom is working. She's at, the, at work at 5 in the morning, and she gets home at 9 o'clock at night. She works all day, and she makes $3 a day for doing that work. That's life for her. She can't afford clean water. So what was she doing? She was living with her mother in our community. And so grandmother was boiling water all day, literally all day for Maria to take care of her and her health. So she is boiling six large cauldrons of water every day, trying to provide clean drinking water to Maria to help her. And so we installed a water filtration system in her home, so now they don't have to worry about trying to buy clean water. Grandma is so excited. She got involved in our women's ministries, and she's one of the leaders now in our women's ministry. Maria's been a part of our, of, of our program. She's blossoming and flourishing in school and health and life and everything like that. And it's because of Conneaut Church of God sparked something with me, that trip about can we do this? Can we provide clean, safe drinking water? And we had a dream to provide, to like capture the water and to provide a, a, a distribution center on our campus, but we were unable to do that. And I think the reason we were unable to do that was because God had a better plan for us to actually go into the homes and provide a water filtration system. And so now every month we're in the homes of these 150 families and we are doing chaplaincy visits. We're measuring the health and well-being of the children. We're checking out the safety situation and making sure that things are going the way they're supposed to do. And so God is, blur is just blossoming and flourishing this program of going into the homes. And so now these alcoholic daddies are finding Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they're coming to the Lord, and they're now a part of our church. These mothers who were party girls are now... They are finding Jesus, and it's just blossoming and flourishing how. And so now I had um, some of these families um, come together, and they made a simple little thank you video that we would like to share with you now. Gracias por la agüita limpia que nos dan. Igualmente, gracias. Vamos a agradecer. Gracias por el agua limpia. Gracias por el agua limpia. Agua viva. Muchas gracias. Amen. 
So at this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Carson and Jessica and Craig and uh, Teresa, if she's here, to come up here for just a moment. We are so thankful for the partnership and how um, this church, Conneaut Church of God, came alongside us uh, seven years ago when we had a crazy dream. It, it's been like five, seven years. It's crazy how the time has passed, but we wanted to take just a moment to honor the Conneaut Church of God on behalf of Project M25 for what they have given as far as clean drinking water now to 150 families for a lifetime and how they have been instrumental in planting the seed of the Word of God in these 150 families and how God is blossoming and flourishing that relationship to where there is truly life transformations as a result of what you gave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you, brother. And Craig, don't you run off yet. Hold on. I'm going to holler at you again. So come on back up here, brother. Don't run away. We know Craig's going to try to run in the shadows, right? But we know. We know. I, I just I asked Pastor if I could take just a moment to give honor where honor is due. This, this couple right here, they are so faithful to send encouragement and love to us as missionaries on the field. You are always behind us. We know that you're praying for us, that you are communicating what's going on on the mission field, but that you believe in us, that you, that you know what we're doing, and, and you just have such a heart for missionaries and for missions projects. And I just wanted to take just a moment and honor you. This is a simple hand towel that's embroidered with with Ecuador on it. But receive it on behalf of world missions and on behalf of uh, missionaries around the world that you serve. We know that you are washing our feet daily, and we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We love you. God bless you. Can we give him honor today? Thank you. You are so awesome. So very briefly, as I said, in your, in your seats, you have, um, there are some cards that have more information, and I'll be in the back after service today that I would love to connect with you. There's two specific ways that I, could, I would just like to briefly mention that, first of all, there is a card there that you can take a moment to fill out. We would love to send you updates about what God is doing. And so in your seats there, there's a simple card there that you can just simply put your name and your email, and you can drop it in the bucket on your way out if you would just like to receive updates from us about what God is doing in Ecuador. And so we invite you to do that. The other thing is to mention with you that there is an Amigos child sponsorship program, and we would love to share with you more about what that, what's going on with that. Just like the story that I was telling you about Maria, we now, because we now are installing these water filtration systems in the home, we have now grown to where we have about an additional 70 children in our program that need sponsors, that need people that will come alongside them and journey with them through life. Uh, So I would love to tell you more about how the sponsorship program uh, encourages the child, how it provides nutrition, helps provide education, uh, helps to ch- check on their well-being and how they're doing in school and providing school uniforms and all of that. And so if you'll stop with me back there in the back, and I just want to sh- highlight one child that really needs a sponsor, and this is Isaac here. He's six years old. Unfortunately, at the beginning of the, at the, of the pandemic, uh, his brother, his 14-year-old brother, um, began to have pain in his legs. And so the hospitals basically shut down and they were overrun by COVID. And so they weren't able to to provide care 
to his older brother, Carlos. And so Carlos's pain continued to increase, and, and the parents continued to try to find him help. And unfortunately, when they were finally able to, give him, to get him some medical attention in December, they realized that he actually had bone cancer in his legs and that the bone cancer had already reached the point of metastasizing, I believe is the name of it. And it had already spread to where there were tumors in his lung and in his abdomen. And so, unfortunately, it's been a really rough road with, with him and his family because his, actually his mom was an active, active member, is an active member of our women's ministry group and a true believer. But unfortunately, over the past six months, Carlos's health continued to, to deteriorate and he actually passed away Monday this week. And my staff is just reeling and it's just wreaking havoc on, on our staff and everything like that. But I was realized Isaac doesn't have a sponsor. He doesn't have somebody who's praying for him and believing with him that he's going to get through this because now he's lost his older brother. And so we have about 70 children that need someone that will come alongside them and believe in them and pray with them as they are journeying through life. Because this, the studies have shown that if, you, if a child knows that someone other than their parent or their teacher actually has hope and belief in them, then their chances at winning at life just skyrocket and blossom. And we know this in youth group, right? We know this if, there's a, strong, if a child is a part of a strong youth group that they, will, they, they have a better chance at life, right? And so that's one of the things that we are trying to do is to pair up these children with, um, with sponsors. I think Pastor Yu and Jessica have been, and Brooke have been sponsoring Pacarina for life. And so pastors always ask me, tell me about Pacarina. What's going on with Pacarina? You know, Pacarina is a wildfire, and she is a community leader, and I think she's got the spirit of Jessica all over her. <laughs> now, she is she's on fire, and she's doing great things and growing. And so you can journey with a child as they, as they go through life. I want to talk very briefly today for just about 10 minutes about ripping through roofs. If you'll join me today in thinking about ripping through roofs, and we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, and it's going to be, you're going to have to hold on, put on your seatbelts. It's like riding with Carson on a jet ski. Hold on. <laughs> we're going to fly through this really fast. But in in chapter 2 of Mark, we have a radical story, a radical account of some people ripping up a roof to get a sick man in front of Jesus. And so let's just skip ahead and let's read Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 through verse 12. To quickly set the story as you're finding this in your Bibles... Jesus has been introduced in the first chapter. It's amazing how this, how he's been baptized by his cousin, how he's, the voice of God has spoken to him audibly that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit thrust him into the wilderness. And those of you that have been to Israel, you know about what that wilderness looked like. Mark Twain, when he was describing the wilderness, said the goats gratefully eat gravel here. Because it is desolate. And so the Spirit of God has thrust Jesus into this. He's out there with wild animals, with beasts, being tempted by the devil and fed by angels. But out of this, he comes out a wild man. And he is doing, he is doing miracles and he is preaching. He's on an evangelistic terror. And so Jesus is doing that. He is healing people, delivering them from demons. He even healed Peter's mother-in-law. Go back and read the story. And you know if, if a man is laying hands and praying for a mother-in-law to get healed, it was Peter's mother-in-law, but still, somebody's got a hold of God then. But out of this, we come to chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house, probably his mother's house, probably his house. 
Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near to him, to Jesus, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed upon which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. The message version, I love how the message version says, Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus said to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive your sins. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go home. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorifying God. We never saw anything like this. Wow, what a story. What a, a precious, amazing story. And we could talk for hours about this story. In Ecuador, they tell me before I go up on the pulpit, if you don't preach for two hours, you are weak. <laughs> We're not in Ecuador today, so don't worry. But let's talk very briefly about these four men who impressed Jesus. As a follower of Christ, I want to I impress Jesus. And so let's look at these Four men to see how did they impress Jesus. And it doesn't tell us a lot about these four men, but there are four characteristics, four attributes of these men that we can quickly look at and we can apply to our lives today. We're going to quickly look at these four attributes, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual areas of these guys. Even though the scripture doesn't say very much, we do immediately recognize if they're carrying a man on a mat, they got to be in decent shape, right? They got to be strong in some capacity. I mean, I've got a little thing right here. And so if you think about it, Pastor Dan, would you come lay on this? And we're, No, I'm just kidding. I am not going to try to carry Pastor Dan across this church. But if you think about it, you know, you've got, a, you've got something here that symbolizes a mat, and you've got somebody laying on that, and for me to pick up a corner of this mat and carry it, I've got to be in some type of decent shape to get him from point A to point B. I don't want to be banging his head across the ground as we're going from point A to point B, making it worse, something else for Jesus to heal. Not only is he paralyzed, but I've knocked him unconscious, Jesus. So they had to be in some type of physical shape to be able to, to pick it up. But they also, they had to be unified in purpose also. You have to think about that. If, if I'm wanting to go east and Pastor Dan's wanting to go south, I mean, you know, I'm going to take them to the park, but you're going to take them to the lake. I mean, you know, we're not going to get very far. So they actually had to be in one accord and come together in purpose to get this person to Jesus. Like, there was no Lone Rangers. Does that click? There, there wasn't somebody saying, I'm going to do it this way. Oh, I'm going to preach today. And I'm going to do it my way. Oh, the Spirit has spoken to me to take him over here. They were in one accord. And they knew, hey, Jesus is over there. And this person needs Jesus. So how do we work together to get him there? That's good preaching, if I say so myself. I might go longer than 12. The second thing is that they were mentally strong. Why do you say they were mentally strong? I, I'm saying they were sharp. They were thinking. Because it says that they got 
to where Jesus was, and there was such a crowd. I mean, it was just thick with people, and there was no way, even at the door, they couldn't get through the door. They couldn't get to the door. And so immediately, they didn't just suddenly drop the man and say, well, Jesus will come over here. This is as far as we can get. I did my part. I tried. I'm sorry, brother. I, I, I did my best. Is this clicking? That, instead, they say, well, we can't go the normal way, the easy way to the roof. Let's get up there. Let's, let's find a way to get this person into the presence of Jesus. I'm not just going to look for the easy way. It's got to be air conditioned. It's got to be an open door. It's got to be easy. No. They said, this person needs Jesus. What do we got to do? Well, let's think creative. Let's think outside the box. Let's get unorthodox. Let's go to the roof. Let's do something different. Is that right? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on. But we get hung up over so many of our traditions and so many of the way things were that there's a lost and dying world who need Jesus. And how are we going to connect with them? Oh, my goodness, I got a 10-year-old. This kid, I'm, I'm off track here, but this TikTok generation, I don't get any of it. I don't understand it. But he does. And how can I leverage that for the glory of God in a way that it connects with the next generation, these preteens, so that they get in the presence of Jesus? They may not wear a jacket or shiny shoes. Okay. How can I get them in the presence of Jesus? Think outside the box. Be creative. Do something different. The third thing is that we know they were emotionally strong. Imagine this roof would have been timbers, just timbers laying across. And it would have been packed in between the timbers with sand and mud and straw. And so when they are ripping through this roof, this dirt and mud is falling inside the house. There's no easy way around this. I mean, here is Jesus, and it says that he's sitting there with the religious leaders preaching, teaching, and all of a sudden, dirt and mud, hardened mud and straw starts falling on them. Can you imagine what those dignified religious leaders, oh, I've never seen that before. How dare he? Get messy for Jesus, people. Get messy for Jesus. He wants to see you do everything possible to get somebody into the presence of Jesus. And so they're ripping through the roof. Imagine the scorn. Imagine the jeers. But they're pushing through. They're emotionally strong. They're like, no, it's all about Jesus. And it's all about this person being delivered and healed and transformed. And I'm going to rip through this roof. Imagine next week. You guys are having a 50-year celebration. And we can imagine the crowd and we can imagine the, the celebration and how exciting. But imagine that this place was so packed that somebody couldn't get in. So they were up on the roof with the saws all trying to get in here. That's getting in the presence of Jesus. And dragging their neighbors and saying, you got you to gotta get here. That's what it's about. They were emotionally strong. They pushed through to get into the presence of Jesus. And finally, I'll even say they were spiritually strong. They were so in tune with the spirit and the mission of Jesus. They knew that I'm not going to blame this person for their sin and their suffering. I'm going to step on all over your toes today, folks. You keep inviting me back. <laughs> I mean, in this time, you have to remember some of those other stories. They talk about how the religious leaders would say, oh, this person's blind from birth. 
Who sinned, Jesus, him or his parents? And so the, they would have put that blame on this person. This person is paralyzed. Who's at fault? What's, what's his, who did wrong? His sins, his parents? And they would have blamed him. Oh, we like to blame folks. We like to say, oh, you got yourself in your own mess there. Now you have to live in it, sleep in that bed that you made, right? That's our human tendency. But these people, you don't see anything recorded about them scorning or condemning this person. Instead, they said, you are broken. You are hurting. You are weak. And I'm going to pick you up. And I'm going to carry you into the presence of Jesus. I'm going to get down where you are. I'm going to get even in the stench and the, where you've laid in your filth. It's messy. It's ugly. It's dirty. And it's uncomfortable. But I know that you need to be in the presence presence of Jesus. So how can we work together to get you in the presence of Jesus? Because in his presence, there is transformation. In his presence, there is deliverance. In his presence, there is life. In his presence, there is liberty. In his presence, there is hope. In his presence, there is life. And that's what it's about, folks. Getting others who need Jesus into his presence to let him do the work, to let him do the transformation, to let him bring life. And in this moment, those four men became agents of hope and change, became agents of hope and change. And this man, not only was his sins forgiven, he was healed and he walked out of there, and the neighbors were like, wow, dude, we've never seen anything like this. And people were amazed, and Jesus was impressed, folks. Will you stand with me? I told you to hold on. It was like riding a jet ski with Carson, Pastor. If there's any way that we can get people into the presence of Jesus, please let us work together and make this happen. Because the world is, is dying and it's broken and it's hurting. Holy moly, it is rough out there, folks. In my community, in your community, people need Jesus. They need the Lord. And in a moment, I'm going to ask the elders if they'll go ahead and come down or the the leaders of the church. I'm going to pray a, a closing prayer. And for those that need to leave, please, I understand. But God is here today, folks. He is here. And we've had wonderful praise and worship. And we've had amazing words from the Lord. And testimonies abound. But the world needs Jesus. They desperately need Jesus. And it needs followers who will say, I'm physically ready. I'm mentally sharp. I'm emotionally stable. And I'm spiritually in tune. So I'm going to grab a hold of that mat and let's go. We're going to bring them to Jesus. And I know that you may have someone, if the elders and leaders, come on down. The elders and the leaders are here to pray with you if you're comfortable to come down and, and to receive prayer because you know somebody that needs Jesus. Who in here knows somebody that needs Jesus? Who in here knows somebody that needs a touch from the Lord? Who in here has in, has in mind somebody's name? They need Jesus. Then I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and to receive prayer and join together with the leaders of this church to call out and to cry out to God for this person. That somehow, Lord, give me an opportunity to bring them into your presence. But today also, you may be standing there and you may be like, I'm not physically able. I need a healing touch from the Lord today. Before I can grab a hold of that mat, I need Jesus to make me whole. We invite you to come down here also to receive prayer for healing in your body so that you will be able to 
Maybe you're mentally in need of thinking outside the box and maybe there's some hangups and you just want God to free your mind so that you can be in tune with the things that he's doing. We invite you to come down and to receive prayer. Maybe you're battling with emotions. I mean, we, were, we had a word from the Lord today about the spirit of fear, right? That would dominate and would overwhelm us. We invite you to come in to receive prayer. Maybe you just need a touch from the Lord in your spiritual man to refresh you and to reboot you and to give you that unction that you need to go forward. We invite you to come down. So I'm going to do the final closing prayer now. And if you would like special prayer, please come forward. If not, go in the peace of the Lord. Heavenly Father, you are such a good and awesome God. And we give you such praise today, Lord. And we honor you, Lord. And we thank you, Holy God, that you are still in the life transformation business. That you continue to touch those things that were dead and you make them bring life and life more abundantly, Lord. And we celebrate that today, Lord. All around us, Lord, there is hurt and there is pain, there is suffering and there is shame, Lord. But in your presence, there is life, there is liberty, there is deliverance, there is healing, there is transformation. And this day, Lord, we trust you we join with you. We believe with you that you will do a beautiful work here in Conneaut and around the world as we, Lord, join with you to bring them into your presence. This day, Lord, we pray your blessings upon your people and upon Conneaut. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like special prayer, these altars are open. We invite you to come forward in Jesus' name.